guys, and welcome to episode 10 of the Geeky Cauldron. My name is Alyssa, and I am going to be talking about the season finale of Doctor Who Season 7, entitled The Name of the Doctor. Now, River Song's favorite word alert. We actually don't find out the name of the Doctor, which a lot of diehard fans are happy about because the whole point is not knowing his name. And it would be kind of stupid if we knew his name. I mean, I, of course, I'm obviously infinitely curious, but that doesn't mean that I necessarily want to know. And now we know who Clara Oswin Oswald is. The episode starts with two guys working in, like, it looks like a tech shop. And they look up at a screen because they're getting an alert. And it's somebody going into the TARDIS repair shop and walking into a TARDIS. And it's clearly the first doctor. And the guy's like, who would be stupid enough to steal a broken TARDIS? And you're like, wow. And then it zooms out and they're in like a snow globe thing. And it says Gallifrey a very long time ago. So it was cool to see a little bit of Gallifrey, even though it was really only like the snow globey part. It was obviously cool to see the first Doctor. Um, there have been a lot of echoes of old Doctors coming back this entire season. We know there's going to be at least one Doctor coming back in the 50th anniversary. Yay, David Tennant! And so it's cool that they keep doing that. It really, I think, no matter how many people may dislike Moffat for his convoluted plot twists and really lengthy plot devices that span across seasons and intertwine with each other, you have to give the man credit for really knowing how to respect the franchise. He really does tip his hat often this season and quite well. So you find out that when the first Doctor seals the TARDIS, he speaks to Clara. She's there and she says to him, Doctor, you're about to make a very big mistake. And then it's Clara, and she's falling through this fiery vortex thing, and she's like, I feel like I'm breaking into a million pieces. Everywhere I go, I'm, I see the doctor, and I'm always trying to save him, and he never hears me. Or he almost never hears me. And the cool thing about this was now you're seeing her with in scenes with all the old doctors. So that fur coat, oh my god, the fur coat. She's dressed all up like in 60s outfits and the 70s outfits and the 80s outfits and you see all the older doctors and her kind of trying to interact with them and scream like, hey, come here, what are you doing? And she's trying to save them. Her voiceover basically sums up that she has seen the doctor all these times and she's always trying to save him and she's the impossible girl. She flew into this world on a leaf, and she was born to save the Doctor. Then it goes to London, 1893, so you automatically know it's going to be the Paternoster Gang. And there's a guy, and he's doing that typical creepy, I'm locked away in a cell, rocking back and forth thing, going, do you hear the Whispermen? The Whispermen are near. If you hear the Whispermen, or some big long song about the Whispermen. And Madame Vastra comes up to him and says, you have information. And he's like, yes, for my freedom. And she's like, well, you murdered a lot of people, so I'm not just going to let you out. The doctor has a secret he will take to his grave. It is discovered. And Madame Vastra's like, fuck, what's going on? She runs back to where she lives and tells Jenny they need to go on a conference call. And the conference call is actually a conversation that spans different time periods that can happen when the people who want to go into the conference call are unconscious. So Jenny and Madame Vastra, they light a couple candles, they get around a table, and they fall asleep. Um, they send a letter, a telegram to the Strax, who is in the middle of some sort of a bar fight with a very large human. And of course you get the hilarious Strax thinking, getting gender confused and beating people up and then he asks the guy to beat him over the head so he'll get knocked unconscious. As they are falling asleep you hear um, a whispering voice go, the doctor's friends will travel where the doctor ends. So this kind of whispery poem thing goes on throughout the entire episode. It's kind of a theme, creepy whispery poems. When Strax joins them he's kind of pissed. He's like, I was in the middle of a good fight, who are we waiting for? And Madame Vassar just goes, the women. And then it goes to Clara in present day and she's trying to make a souffle for Angie and Artie. And she's like, by the end of this, I will be souffle girl. And of course, everyone who's a fan goes, okay. So she's trying to make the souffle and she says, the souffle isn't the souffle, the souffle is the recipe. So, you know, 
whoops. She gets a letter, and the letter's from Madame Vastra, and in the letter it says, Clara, I want you to know that the doctor is in danger, and I'm contact contacting you to let you know that we need to speak. Here's a candle, and you need to light it, because when you light it, it has a soporific, or whatever that word was, and it's going to make you pass out, and you're going to wake up in a dream state and be able to communicate with us. And she kind of looks at it like, I don't do that. And she's like, considering I think you wouldn't trust me, I've also put that same soporific in this letter. Talk to you soon. And then Clara passes out flat on her face. So then Clara joins them. And now they're all sitting around this table, but there's still an empty chair. Plume of smoke, River Song. Now all of them are drinking tea that Madame Vastra is serving. So Madame Vastra asks River, would you like some tea? And River goes, sure. And then boom, she has a bottle of champagne. She's sipping a glass of champagne. And Jenny's like, how did you do that? And she just goes, disgracefully. Now the great thing about Alex Kingston is she is so flirty and sassy that it oozes out of her every pore. So everything she says is like somehow sensual and it's just perfect for her character. It really is. And as much as I wasn't a huge River Song fan in terms of the relationship with the Doctor, you know, I, I like I said, I was much more of a Rose and Ten. Um, I still can't help but love Alex Kingston. As soon as she was back, you know, she just injected some life into the episode and it really was fantastic. Ha. Huh. You realize if you paid attention that she's wearing the same outfit that she wears when she's um, uploaded into the library, in Silence in the Library, so that makes an, a difference later on in the episode. That ambassador tells them that this guy, Clarence DeMarco, the one who was rocking back and forth in the jail cell, told her that he knows the location of the Doctor's greatest secrets, and she puts up a bunch of space-time coordinates. Clara's like, what do you mean his greatest secret? And, and Madame Vastra's like, if you're still entertaining the idea that he tells you things he doesn't tell anybody else, what's his name? And River's like, I know his name. And Clara's all, what the hell? And it's like, old girlfriend, new girlfriend, battle! So Jenny starts getting a little bit uncomfortable, and it's because she's starting to hear the Whispermen. They are being surrounded, their dreaming bodies are being surrounded in reality by the Whispermen, and Jenny is noticing it in this alternate, you know, time-linked conference call. Everyone else is still kind of just chatting, and they have no idea what's going on. So River asks Madame Vastro, what was the one word that he gave you? Did, what did he say in context with all of this? And she just goes, Trenzalore. So we know this. What's his name? Dorian talked about Trenzalore. We know that Trenzalore is really where he can't go. I mean, everybody knows this. Jenny starts panicking, and she keeps going, Madame, I'm sorry, I forgot to lock the door. And Madame Vastro's like, shut up, like we're talking. And she's like, no, seriously, someone's broken in. And then she starts freaking out even more, and she's like, I've been murdered. So she disappears from the conference call. River slaps Madame Vastra, throws champagne, and distracts his face, because they both need to wake up. And Madame Vastra wakes up, and the Whispermen are surrounding Jenny. And she's screaming, what did you do to her? What's going on? And they close in on her. And then Strax wakes up and he's lying on the floor and the Whispermen are surrounding him. And once again, we get the whispers. His friends are lost forevermore unless he goes to Trenzalore. Clara is obviously upset and he asks her what's wrong. And now, once again, we see Matt Smith at his acting finest, which is probably why Ryan Gosling cast him in that movie, which you should look into because he shaved his head and it's really scary. So they cut to, obviously, after Clara has started explaining to him what she heard in the conference call. She asks him who River is, and he says she's an ex. And then he gets very upset, visibly, you know, crying and, and shaking, and starts going, are, are you sure it was Trenzalore? Is that what they said? And she's like, yeah, it was Trenzalore. And she's talking to him, and he just he can't control himself anymore. He just goes, oh, oh dear, and, and runs out. You hear the front door shut. And when Clara goes back to him, he's in the TARDIS, and he's kind of sitting underneath the console, tinkering with things, which clearly is some form of therapy for him. And she asks him, you know, what are we going to do? And he's, he can't go there. You know, I'm not supposed to go there. It's just not a place that I can go. And she's like, why? He sticks Clara's hand into the telepathic circuit because she still has the coordinates in her memory. And he says, listen, there's one place you must never go when you're a time traveler. The doctor has a secret he will take to his grave. It is discovered. He wasn't talking about my secret. He was talking about my grave. Trenzalore is where I'm buried. And now, this is not what I was expecting. 
at all. It wasn't. I mean, I was seeing tombstones and I saw Rivers' tombstone, but for some reason I wasn't thinking that this must be where he's buried. For some reason I just wasn't entertaining the fact of a dead doctor. I can't think of a dead doctor. I don't want to think of a dead doctor. So I was really shocked. I mean, maybe I was just reading things entirely wrong, but I was genuinely like, oh, what? This is where he's, he's dead? His body lies? So Clara's like, well, you obviously can't go. And the doctor's like, well, these people took care of me in my darkest time. I have to go. It's, it's what I need to do. There's no point in telling me that it's too dangerous, right? And she's like, no, of course not. So he puts in the coordinates for Trenzalore, and of course the TARDIS is like, bitch, you are not going there. I am not letting you go anywhere near that place. So it starts freaking out, and then it shuts down right in orbit outside of the planet. And Trenzalore is this black, molten -y lava planet, which was in interesting because it kind of looked like the Lancashires, that their body type, the way that their skin was made up. So the TARDIS is orbiting outside of this planet because she doesn't like him crossing his own timeline, which is something, you know, you're never supposed to do. We've heard that a million times before. Him and Clara are looking at the planet and he's like, I always thought maybe I'd retire and take a beekeeping or something. I guess not. And she's like, what do we do? Do we jump? He's like, don't be silly, we fall. The TARDIS has everything off except for the gravity, anti-gravity, so guess what I'm turning off? And he turns off the anti-gravity and they plummet to Trenzalore and land, cracking a piece of the glass pane on the TARDIS, which I thought was interesting. I'm a time traveler. I've time traveled more than anybody. My grave is probably the most dangerous place in the universe. And it's not just the doctor's grave. The planet is a graveyard. And it's a battlefield graveyard. So he, he says to Clara that the higher the tombstone, the bigger the tombstone, the higher the rank. And as he says that, you look up and off into the distance and you see this giant TARDIS. And Clara's like, well, that's a hell of a monument. And he's like, it's not, it's not a monument, it's the TARDIS. She's like, no, I, I know it's the TARDIS. He's like, no, 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 it's the TARDIS. When the TARDIS gets old, it usually leaks size. It has a size leak. The whole bigger on the inside starts leaking into the outside and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. That's my dying TARDIS. And it's just, the imagery alone was really just jarring to see a giant, dark TARDIS. Focusing on death this much in one episode was really a cool thing to do because we, there is a lot of death in Doctor Who. We do learn a lot about death in Doctor Who. It really shows you how people cope with death. But his death has never been an option because he doesn't die. Yes, it's very sad when he regenerates, but he doesn't die. And so to see this was really, it was upsetting and it made you nervous because you're like, when is he going to die? That means he's going to die. I mean, we all know he's going to die, but we don't really like to entertain that. And he says, you know, what else would they bury me in but my TARDIS? So they start going. As the doctor walks away, River pops up and she's like, listen, I kept the conference call open so you and I are still connected. Okay? Don't tell him I'm here. And of course the doctor turns around and goes, River? and he's actually looking at her tombstone. It's out in the middle of this graveyard, kind of non-specific. It's just a random tombstone. There's nothing special about it. And he's like, her grave can't be here. And as he says that, the whisper men start closing in on them. And what's cool about this is you see River helping Clara even though they have this kind of rivalry and the doctor can't hear River. And she's like, maybe it's not my tombstone. And then Clara goes, maybe, maybe it's not a tombstone. She's like, maybe it's a false grave. She's like, maybe it's a false grave. And then she's like, maybe it's a secret entrance to your tomb. And she's like, maybe it's a secret entrance to your tomb. He goes, that makes sense. They'd never bury my wife out here. And she goes, you're what? And then boom, they fall. Jenny, Strax, and Madame Vastra wake up and they're all in the TARDIS and Jenny's dead. Until Strax revives her. They wake up and guess who's there? Dr. Simeon, the man who the great intelligence controlled, or also the manager from Spice World. Unfortunately, I'm still in mind without a body, and he just takes off his hat and disappears, and you see another Whisperman step forward and turn into him. So that's the reason why the Whisperman look so much like Dr. Simeon, because they're basically just shadows, echoes, here we go with echoes, echoes of him. So he says, here we are, the Doctor's tomb, the vessel of the final darkness, the slaughterer of ten billion, and then they go back to the Doctor and Clara who are in the tombs, and Clara's like, why did I meet your dead wife? And he's like, well, you know, I did whatever anybody would do. You know, I made a backup of her. And River's like, he left me in the largest library in the universe, like a book on the shelf. 
he doesn't like goodbyes. And then they're getting chased. And you go back to Dr. Simeon, who's still on his evil villain monologue, and he's like, Trenzalore. It was a minor skirmish by his standards, but it was too much for the old man. He died here. So he died on this battlefield. And he had other names before he died. The Storm. The Valiard. The Beast. And you're like, what? Where? What are you talking about? Jenny, Madavaster, and Strax, they really don't believe him. They don't believe that the Doctor is this sort of man. So they're kind of having an argument back and forth with him, all while Clara and the Doctor are trying to get to the tomb from underneath in the catacombs. When they get to a certain point, Clara starts stumbling and falling, and she starts getting flashbacks from Journey to the Center of the TARDIS. She starts remembering. She's getting a sort of deja vu feeling of when they were running through the inner hallways of the TARDIS. She starts kind of hyperventilating and freaking out and going, What do you mean I died? She's remembering when he freaked out on her. He's like, this isn't the time. We can't talk about this. She's like, why did I die so many times? Why am I impossible? Yes. What? You Are you serious? No. Oh, fuck. The girl who died he tried to save shall die again inside his grave. So, we know kind of what's going to happen at this point. Sorry I had to stop. I got a flat tire. Dr. Simeon says that the door to the tomb requires a word. One word that only the doctor knows. Guess it's got to be his name. And when the doctor arrives and says, oh, I guess I'm late for my own funeral, the doctor gets up really close to him and says, I will not open my own tomb. And there's like a face grabbing and a hand grabbing and a lot of testosterone going on. It was pretty awesome. And Dr. Simeon goes, okay, stop their hearts. And the Whispermen all start closing in on him. And he's like, no, what are you doing? And everyone's freaking out. And then he finally goes, please. And of course, in his British accent, I didn't really understand what he said because the tomb opened up as soon as he said please and I was like did he say his name is that his name I don't know what, what did he say and it turns out that Ghost River said his name and she's like the TARDIS can still hear me good and then Dr. Simeon or Mr. G intelligence as the doctor called him says you know what's inside this tomb for me peace for you pain everlasting this guy's pretty pissed. Like, he's, like, very angry. But they get inside the TARDIS, and it's basically just a big, giant console room. And in the center, where the console usually is, is this crazy, undulating, like, sparking connection of lights that are, like, it's floor-to-ceiling, crazy, sparking, lightning-bolt-looking lights. And Clara goes, what is that? And he goes, Time travel is damage. It's a tear in the fabric of reality. That is the scar tissue of my journey. From Gallifrey... To Trenzalore. And then he sonics it, and then you hear all the voices of the doctors again. So we get, we're getting so many echoes of the past. And he goes, all of my days are here. Even the days I haven't lived yet. And then falls over. And he's like, this is too bad of a paradox. I shouldn't be here. This isn't good. And he's lying on the ground, completely immobile. He's completely useless to everybody. So now you see what Simeon's plan was the entire time. He wants to insert himself in the Doctor's timeline, because as the Doctor says, you will be strewn across my timeline like confetti. Millions of pieces of you. You'll die just by doing this. And he's like, it doesn't matter, because you've thwarted me at every single turn. And now, I can turn all of your victories into defeats. I can poison all of your friendships. I can basically ruin your legacy. That's pretty good revenge. And so he steps into the Doctor's timeline. And then you see that opening sequence with Clara in all different points and times with all different Doctors. Now that's Dr. Simeon standing there. And Madame Vastra's like, he's being rewritten and he's screaming and writhing on the floor in pain. And you see him dying at the Dalek Asylum. You see him dying at the hands of Dr. Simeon when he was all icy and creepy and the snowmen. Madame Vastra goes, a universe without the Doctor. There will be consequences. So she leads Strax and Jenny outside. And the Doctor's groaning and crying almost and going, my whole life is burning. And it's really, really sad. Really sad. Damn it, Moffat. The Doctor's entire timeline has been corrupted. All of these solar systems, all these planets that he saved are blinking out of existence. And Strax is now a dickhead like all the other Santarans, and Jenny is now dead because he saved Jenny. So it's just Madame Vastra because Strax attacks her and she kills him. Clara realizes, I have to go in there. I've done this already. You've seen me do this already. This is why I'm the impossible girl. River comes in and she's like, don't do it. The time winds will tear you into a million little pieces. You'll be scattered throughout the Doctor's timeline like echoes. And Clara's like, but I can still save him. And River's like, but it won't be you. It, it just won't be. It'll be echoes of you. The real you will die as soon as you do this. 
And she says what she said in the beginning. The souffle isn't the souffle, the souffle is the recipe. So, Clara isn't Clara. Clara could be a bunch of these little tiny Claras made up to save the doctor. She was born to save the doctor, the impossible girl. And now, God damn it, Moffat, you are good. You have to say it's a little bit like J.K. Rowling in that J.K. knew the ending of Harry Potter before she wrote everything else. Because as Clara walks into the timeline, she says, as soon as I go in here, run. Get as far away from here as you can, as quickly as you can. And spare me a thought now and then. And then right before she walks in, she looks over her shoulder and goes, you know what, it's... never mind that. Run, you clever boy, and remember me. So that's why she keeps saying it. That's why it's an echo. And she runs into the timeline and there's this big explosion. And now you're getting the falling from the beginning of the episode. I don't know where I am. I feel like I'm bursting into a million tiny pieces. I don't know what's going on. So we're getting the echoes. Somebody in one of my comments mentioned something about echoes and noticing all of these echoes. And thank you, good Lord, because you were right. These echoes are there for a reason. They're echoing Clara because the bad wolf idea may not have been right. What the bad wolf theory entails was the similar idea that she was scattered throughout time and space. We know that she was scattered throughout time and space. We never thought to think it would be the Doctor's timeline, and that's why Moffat knew we'd never get it right, because he created this whole idea. He created the idea of the Doctor's tomb. He created the idea of his body being a rift in time. And he created the idea of Clara saving him. So the Clara that was born from the leaf flying onto her father's face is the Clara that gets scattered throughout time and space. So she is the original Clara. She's the OG. The coolest thing about this is the beginning, when you see the first doctor going to steal a TARDIS, you see Clara say, you're about to make a big mistake. But you don't see what she continues on saying. And she says, don't steal that one, steal this one. The navigation system's knackered, but you'll have much more fun. So now you see that Clara didn't just save him. Clara single-handedly made him in certain way, shape, and form. Like, she was the driving force behind some major decisions in his life, including the biggest one of them all, which TARDIS he picked. He picked the TARDIS that had a fucked up navigation system, but always brought him not where he wanted to go, but where he needed to be. And Clara was the one that made that decision. That is pretty cool. You just made her so important. So we're picking up where we left off because a lot of things happened. This is my boyfriend, Dave. He's going to eat in the background. Your last episode? Mm-mm. Before the camera cut out. Oh, I was talking about how it was really interesting that Clara has been there since the beginning. We now learned that she's the reason why he picked his TARDIS. And I don't have my notes, so how am I going to do this? You think that everything's all fine and dandy because Strax is back, Jenny's back, Madame Vastra's fine because she was always fine, and the doctor's standing up and okay. And Madame Vastra's like, oh, well, we're all fully restored, and he's like, no, we're not. Clara isn't, and they're like, you can't go in there because you can't go into your own time stream, and he's like, well, fuck that, I need to save Clara, I'm going to do whatever I want. And now here comes the interesting part, because the whole episode, you're thinking that he can't hear River. How do you turn it off? How do you turn it off? You guys are going to have an epileptic fit, because I can't figure out how to make this fan turn off. You find out that this entire time, you think the doctor can't see River, that the only person that can see River is Clara, because they're still connected through the conference call, but that's not true. The Doctor, even though he hates saying goodbyes, can actually see River and has seen River this entire episode because she goes to slap him in the face because apparently she's in a slap happy mood this episode because he's insisting upon going in his own time stream and she goes to slap him and he grabs her hand. Now, like I just said before, I am not a River Doctor shipper. I don't really like their relationship. I understand that it's necessary, but call me a romantic. I actually really prefer the cutesy adorableness to the badass crazy River. I'm also a little bit more of a feminist, so when it's a badass chick, I don't necessarily think she needs to date him. She should just be a badass chick. They have an amazing kiss. It's like an absolutely amazing kiss. You have to give them credit. I don't know how much older Alex Kingston is than Matt Smith, but goddamn, those two have really good chemistry. So they kiss. He says, I never said goodbye because I thought it would hurt me too much. And then he says, but you should have faded away a long time ago. And she's like, well, I can't because you haven't said goodbye to me. And he says a really adorable, I'll catch you later, Professor Song. And then she says, well, by the way, before I go, there's one more thing. If Clara were really dead, I would know because we're still mentally linked. Goodbye, sweetie. <laughs> this is it, people. River is not coming back. We were suspecting she wasn't coming back because we hadn't seen her in a while. She's really not coming back. We are at the point where it is past when River has been uploaded into the library. It is past silence in the library. Her timeline is over.
Done. No more Alex Kingston. She did a great job. And we get back to the repetitive, Clara falling through this time vortex thing, and she doesn't know where she is. I don't know if anybody else noticed, but when she actually lands in the bottom of whatever this doctor timeline is, you hear three knocks. Very slowly, but you hear three knocks. I watched it again. Three knocks. Yep, three knocks. You start hearing the doctor's voice. It's like, you can hear me. I'm everywhere. See, look. And then you see versions of the doctor running by. He's like, I'm inside my own time stream and it's collapsing. And she's like, well, get out. He's like, well, I'm not getting out without you. And she's bugging out because I think this is what happens when you go into a time stream. You start losing track of who you are. So she's kind of having a panic attack. And he sends her down a leaf. What leaf? The leaf. We all know what leaf it's going to be. He's like, you blew in on this leaf. Now hold on to this leaf and you'll come to me. So she holds on to it and then he's there. He grabs onto her and he's like, oh my god, Clara, my Clara, this is amazing, awesome, fantastic. And then, looking over Clara's shoulder, there is a figure. And from the back, I think everybody knew we didn't recognize this figure. Never seen him before. And even Clara says, what? I, I've never seen that one, okay? I've seen all of you. Eleven faces. You're the eleventh doctor. I now fully understand because of the article I read and watching it a second time. I said, he was me. I said he was me. I never said he was the doctor. The doctor is the name that I chose. When you choose a name, it's like a promise. He's the one that broke that promise. So, this is somebody who's technically the doctor, but somebody he doesn't consider the doctor. And then, lo and behold, the person turns around and it's John Hurt, a.k.a. Ollivander, a.k.a. what else was he in? Okay, so, while he's looking that up, Clara starts to pass out and he picks her up and he's like, this is my secret. So his secret isn't his name, obviously. We're thinking this whole time that his name is the secret. It's not, because he has already made it clear that he chose the name the doctor, and he chose that name for a reason. He chose it to be the doctor. He wanted to become this man. So his name isn't what's important. What's important is the person who broke that promise. And he says, he broke the promise. What I did, I did without choice. And Matt Smith goes, I know. And he goes, and in the name of peace, and what is it? Uh, and in the name of peace and sanity, and then Matt Smith goes, but not in the name of the doctor. And then he walks away. And then it goes, introducing John Hurt as the doctor. And John Hurt is from... Which one did you say? John Hurt. Ollivander. I don't know. Ollivander. Ollivander. He's, he's Ollivander in Harry he's Potter. He's also an alien. He's also an alien. And he's also V for Vendetta. He's also well, in V for alien. Vendetta. So now we know who this dude is. Here's the thing. And since I don't have a lot of time... We're going to tell you really quickly that what I read online, which makes a lot of sense with everything else, is that he is not the 12th Doctor. So everybody calm down. I'm sure this is still going to be a hot piece of ass as the next Doctor. We don't have to look at a wrinkly old man. Hopefully, hopefully a Rupert Grint, because I really want him to be a ginger. But anyway, what a lot of people are saying is he's actually the 9th Doctor. Christopher Eccleston is technically the 10th. David Tennant is technically 11th. Matt Smith is technically the 12th, which sucks because... That means that we are now pushed back an entire regeneration, and that means that this next Doctor is going to be the last, if it stays true to one of the books where it mentioned that he only has 12 regenerations slash 13 lives. That would also kind of explain why there was so much Death of the Doctor explored in this season finale. If there's only going to be a couple more seasons, you really should start toying with the idea that the Doctor's eventually going to die. I don't fucking like it. It makes me really sad. But according to what my friend said, this show is supposed to end in a couple of years and not come back again for ten years after that. I think it's a fucking awful idea. Anyway, so, we're thinking he's the ninth Doctor. We're thinking he's the Doctor that made that terrible decision back on Gallifrey that ended the Time War and killed all the Time Lords. So we're thinking that's the reason why he didn't do things in the name of the Doctor, but he did what he had to do for the name of Peace and Sanity. So there you go. This guy that we met, John Hurt, Ollivander, whatever the fuck you want to call him, he is the doctor. So whatever he did was pretty fucked up, and now we have to wait until November 23rd to see more of him, which sucks. But this is not the last video. We are going to do a video, more videos, about John Hurt, because we want to figure out what the fuck's going on. Any information I'll get. Also, I'm going to go back through all of my favorite episodes for you guys. Do a quick video on my favorite episodes. I'm not going to tell you any of them now, but a lot of them have David Tennant in them. And I'm going to start reviewing a different show, possibly Game of Thrones. Potentially, maybe I'll go into Sherlock and start going over some old Sherlock episodes. I'm not really sure yet. But I promise I'm going to keep it nerdy. I'm not getting rid of you guys. Just because Doctor Who's over doesn't mean I'm leaving. And I have to go because this is going to be a 40-minute video that I have to edit down into 20, and that's going to fucking suck. See you later. Goodbye, everyone.
Thank Allons you. I'm sorry, it's over. Say goodbye, David. See you guys. Really good background prop, don't you think?